Cheers. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me. I'd like to actually extend a, a big thank you to the Aragon team, Jorge and Luis and Stefano uh, and their entire team, not only for putting on this event, but for everything they do to push crypto governance forward uh, in our community. Um, the work that they're doing is, is fantastic. I'm excited to be a part of their community and really excited to uh, watch this project grow and evolve and also work with them more closely with uh, Polkadot and Web3. Just to talk a little bit about Web3, what is Web3 um, to start? It is Gavin Wood's vision for a server serverless uh, decentralized internet where users have greater control over their privacy, their sovereign identity, their financial accounts, and ultimately their own destiny. Where decentralized networks leverage trustless incentivization through sound crypto economic de design. And when we talk about crypto economic design, we also talk about crypto governance design. Uh, why do we call it Web3? So we went through the era of Web1, which is sort of the 90s, static websites, um, really no monetization except for advertising, terrible UX, UI. Then we evolved into Web2. This was social, mobile. Websites became more interactive and users could, could create content and, uh, and, and connect with one another. Uh, what monetization, though, continued to be basically an advertising model, even though it evolved a little bit into the, you know, what we call surveillance capitalism. Um, privacy issues remain. Uh, we've had this massive consolidation of power into, a, into essentially a cartel, and, uh, and now we're in the dawn of a new era of, of Web3, where decentralized applications built and operating on WASM virtual machines, monetization is baked directly in at the protocol layer, uh, and that's really interesting. Uh, you, you know, w what I often say is that uh, Web2 got user growth right really easily, but had difficulty with monetization. Web3 has struggled with user growth, but got monetization right um, sort of natively. And very fortunately in Web3, we see a better uh, decentralization and distribution of power and wealth. The Gini coefficient, even in current crypto networks, is much lower than what we see in, in Web2 markets and uh, society at large. Uh, so we know that we're on the right path. So why does this matter? Why does Web3 matter? It matters because Web2 has failed us. A small cartel of companies control more than 80% of cloud storage, more than 90% of cloud compute. An even smaller cartel of companies control almost all of your data. They commercialize it as they see fit, and you are essentially the product of Web2. I often say that uh, we shouldn't get the use of Twitter or Facebook for free we should be paid to use Facebook and Twitter and share our information with them. And this is the type of thing that, that Web3 technologies enable. And with Web3 technologies and better control of our data so that we can, we can monetize our own data to, to whoever we see fit, we can get into more interesting models that could actually end up looking like universal basic income. If Facebook had to pay every one of its users, we could have a, actually a first best attempt at universal basic income. Um, so, you know, Web2 models, I think we can all agree, are uh, monetization models, that is, are uh, unethical, and frankly, we deserve better. So enter Web3. And just to talk a little bit about our cultures and our values, what we want to create are borderless public goods commons, where there's representation and proper governance across these commons. We're and we believe that transparent, enforceable governance is a noble pursuit in and of itself. And while we don't have the perfect governance model for, e for every constituent or every community, pursuing this matters and we should continue to do so. We also need safe, uh, safe spaces for experimentation, for pushing this, uh, you know, pushing the vanguard forward and um, continuing to innovate and experiment with crypto economic models, with crypto governance models that are upgradable and, uh, and can be adjusted over time. 
because we, again, we don't have all the answers. And we believe that sound cryptoeconomic design that creates an appropriate Nash equilibrium between networks can acceler accelerate network effects. And so we're excited about the convergence of these technologies. So enter Polkadot. And why am I so excited about Polkadot? Why are we all, a lot of people here so excited about Polkadot? First, it's incredibly technically ambitious. Using parallelized security, we can allow for arbitrary smart contract messaging across chains. Uh, this allows, say, an Ethereum smart contract to talk with a, a Tezos smart contract or a Ethereum smart contract to potentially make a, a transaction on, on the Zcash blockchain. Um, this is very interesting and, and, and can obviously open up new use cases uh, and new applications for many people. Uh, Polkadot leverages uh, a novel uh, hybrid consensus mechanism, uh, uh, offers increased security, and a novel crypto economic design between the different actors on this network. Uh, but something that we're all excited about here this week is, uh, is a crypto governance model, and I'll get into this uh, a little bit further. But then myself as an investor in this space for a long time, a, a big signal that I've taken from, from this project is just the team. Um, the, the V1 is being built out by the Parity team, and this is an extraordinary team of uh, some of the leading minds in the space, again, pushing the vanguard forward. And uh, I'm just incredibly uh, humbled to see just how much they ship, um, and not only ship, but ship on time. So just a quick overview of, of Polkadot. So you've got a relay chain, which is essentially the base chain, and then other blockchains can connect into that base chain, either being built as a native parachain, so they can build using the substrate framework and connect into Polkadot natively, or if there's some legacy issues there, they can have a bridge. Um, and that's the case in, uh, for Ethereum that's building a bridge. It's the case for Zcash that, that's building a bridge. But we're here mostly to talk about crypto governance this week. And this is um, a topic of particular interest and I think one of the most exciting areas um, uh, in our industry. And so what's cool and new about Polkadot's crypto governance? So we have referendums. Um, I'll get into something called adaptive quorum biasing, which is a really interesting uh, innovation that solves part of the problem of, of low turnout. Uh, there's a council that allows for quick decisions on certain matters uh, and sort of uh, just sort of gatekeeping uh, other matters and ensuring that people aren't attacking the, uh, the network with, with referendum for, for frivolous items. There's something called lock voting, which we'll talk about a, a, a little bit. That council goes through its own approval voting, and then part of the block reward of Polkadot goes into a treasury DAO that will not only uh, incentivize validators, but will also incentivize other key constituents in the network like protocol layer developers, application developers, and even users. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, delayed autonomous enactment, which is a, a nice security mechanism that I think a lot of governance models should implement. So we have a council that goes through uh, approval voting. This council um, yeah, switches out one member per month over time. If the council proposes a vote either unanimously or by supermajority, it gets tabled faster, and then the adaptive quorum biasing changes. However, any coin holder can also table a vote at any time. They stake, and then other people can stake with them to get that, that vote or that measure voted on uh, more quickly. So think of it kind of like Reddit upvote, downvote style um, in order for motions to be actually tabled for a vote. And then once things come together for a vote, it essentially go, uh, sits with the coin holders. However, you can add more weight to your votes, to your tokens. It's not just one token, one vote. Uh, what, what we have is what we call time lock voting. So a quick example here, uh, Alice, Bob, and Charlie. Uh, Alice and Charlie vote no on, on the first vote, and they lock uh, their tokens, Alice has, has one, Charlie has four, they lock their tokens for eight weeks and two weeks respectively. Bob, who has a lot of tokens and believes in this, in, in the issue at hand, votes yes, and he locks for six weeks uh, respectively. Now, because he has more dots and locks for a longer period of time, Bob uh, wins the vote, 
But then his, his tokens are locked over that period of time, and Alice and Charlie have an opportunity to leave the system if they, if they don't believe in what's happening. If they think that this is a catastrophic event, they may, they may decide to leave the system. They can do so. Bob can't. Um, in, so a, a second example, uh, Alice and, and Charlie actually believe really strongly in, uh, in the, the, the matter at hand. Bob, not so much, so he only... Uh, he only agrees to lock for four weeks. In this case, the, uh, the no wins the vote, and so Alice and Charlie are locked in. They can't do anything with, with their tokens, and Bob has the opportunity to, to opt out. This is a way around the but the Plutarchs argument, um, where not only does it matter uh, how many tokens you have, but it matters how much you're willing to stake yourself uh, to be in this system should uh, what you want go through. Um, and then another thing, which is actually a really interesting uh, innovation, I think Gavin Wood will be remembered for many innovations in this space, but adaptive core and biasing uh, will certainly probably be one of them. And uh, so what happens here is if the council proposes a vote, then the, and there's low turnout, then you need a lot of no's over the yeses in order to reject the vote. If a, a regular coin holder proposes a vote, you need more yeses over those no's if there's low turnout. As you get higher turnout, it, it tends towards you know, 50 plus 1% anyways. But in the cases of low turnout, what will matter is has it gone through the council or has it just been proposed by by any coin holder, and this is just a, a mechanism of security to ensure that we don't have a random uh, uh, proposal proposed by a coin holder and then voted at some, some obscure time and uh, with low turnout passes and, and then goes through and that's, and that's catastrophic. We, we use the council along with this dynamic quorum biasing in order to ensure security in the governance mechanism. And th this, again, I think is a really important innovation in crypto governance. So roadmap for Polkadot. Um, again, as I mentioned, one of the most impressive things about this project and, and the reason why I decided to focus my time here is, is this team and their ability to, to execute. And so Polkadot will ship this year, uh, later on in, in 2019. We're incredibly excited about it. We're seeing an incredible wave of talented entrepreneurs and projects uh, migrating to the Polkadot network um, and seeing the solutions that Polkadot offers, whether it's from security or a novel crypto economic design or interesting governance and the fact that it'll evolve um, in an appropriate fashion. Uh, so uh, this is very exciting and, um, and we're, you know, we couldn't be happier about the progress. So some cool things that are being built in the Polkadot ecosystem already. There's lots of different projects, but I'll just highlight a, a few with the, with the time that I have left. Um, one is Substrate. So this is a development framework that allows you to easily spin up a blockchain and spin up uh, uh, decentralized applications uh, and, and be able to deploy them on, on Polkadot. Uh, it comes native with a, a light client. Um, it is architected using a WASM or a, a you know, WASM VM, uh, also uses libp 2 p There's a, a Rust as the primary implementation. However, uh, uh, we're, we're going to see other implementations in JavaScript, in Go, in C++ uh, over time. And, and what this does is it abstracts away the low layer part of building up a decentralized application or even your own blockchain and you can focus just on your app and your user experience, and that low layer part of, of spinning up a blockchain is basically done for you. This is a blockchain in a box, essentially. Um, at the Web3 Summit last year, uh, Gavin spun up a blockchain and deployed an app in about 15 minutes. This was something that took years uh, before, and now a substrate is, is relatively trivial. So a, a really important innovation for our space. Um, there's lots of documentation and recipes, and so I suggest you go and uh, take a look at Substrate. Even a, even a relatively non-technical, uh, uh, higher abstraction developer uh, can spin something up here. 
Um, and another project which I'm particularly interested in is Edgeware. Uh, so Edgeware is an experimental chain that has real financial incentives, and the idea is that we test and evolve governance mechanisms. It will also have a DAO treasury, so about approximately half the block reward will go into this, this DAO, and the DAO will recursively fund development and evolution of the ecosystem. So this is app developers and further protocol layer development, and even uh, you know, the wider community evangelism usage, uh, so on and so forth. We are also using a novel funding mechanism. Uh, actually, it's not a funding mechanism. There, all the tokens are going to be d distributed to the community via lock and drop. So you'll be able to lock your ETH or your DOTS. You'll get your ETH or DOTS back over some period of time. So you can lock for three, six, or 12 months. And then you'll get edge tokens, which give you the rights to vote um, towards the distribution of the DAO and participate in the network. Again, because of the experimental nature of this, you, can, you, you will definitely get your tokens back that you lock, um, but it allows you in a very low risk manner to participate in, in this network. Uh, Edgeware is really interesting, and I'm, I'm sure the Aragon guys are, are also seeing this, but with Edgeware, I've been seeing this great migration of like political science, academics, and people from the traditional governance world getting excited about crypto for the first time because they see this as, as an opportunity for, for them to, to move their field, move their field of academic study or business forward. Um, and, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, so uh, keep an eye out for, for Edgeware. Uh, other collabs, again, uh, you know, we, we've seen this great migration of, of teams getting excited uh, in the space. Um, so, uh, you know, Aragon uh, announcing yesterday, um, Zcash and Ethereum both intending to build bridges, but there are other projects like Edgeware, like Blink, which is a, um, a DAG, uh, there are a number of tools uh, like Pokescan and Pokesource, uh, Clover, uh, which is a great, uh, really well done um, IDE. Um, and we're, we're, you know, we're just incredibly grateful uh, and, and very excited with all the partnerships and, uh, and community members that we've been able to develop. Um, so if you want to join the, the community, um, it's a vibrant global community. Uh, we have been all over the world in the last 12 months uh, doing meetups and connecting with, uh, with members of our community, and we'll be all over the world over the next 12 months. So please do uh, connect with us. And uh, if you're exci as excited about Polkadot as I am, reach out. We're hiring for a number of different positions right now. Uh, and we're also looking for more community members to join in uh, a number of different technical and non-technical roles. So connect with us uh, either here or, um, or on various social channels and, uh, and get involved. And so thank you.